Well, thanks everyone, and thanks to Fan for organising Riskin. Welcome to today's presentation. The title of my presentation today is How to Assess Risk in 2020 Without Using Matrices and Formulas, and that's exactly what I'll be talking about today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Julian Talbot. I have a Master of Risk Management, and I'm a Fellow of the Institute of Strategic Risk Management. Uh, as one of the founders of the Citadel Group Limited, I was instrumental in taking that company from a startup working out of coffee shops to a listing on the Australian Stock Exchange. Now I work with organisations that want to implement enterprise risk management and achieve commercial and operational objectives. I've helped clients with risk management on five continents, working with some of the largest commercial resources sector and government agencies in the world, as well as some of the smallest startups. In this presentation, I'm going to focus on some core strategies that in conjunction with what you're already doing, will improve your risk analysis and management. I'm also going to talk about three different types of risk, some risk analysis issues, causal chains, and how to implement fundamental improvements through culture change, all designed to help you achieve your desired objectives and create a high-performing culture. So at the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you some research, free templates, downloads, graphics, and additional information that you can use to implement these three strategies, all without having to learn any complex new formulas or throw out what you're already doing. I promise you that. So when you're done, I'm going to give you a link to get in touch and invite you to consider the opportunity to work together on implementing your risk management. Uh, now, I can't work with everybody, and the simple truth is if you want to be part of a high-performing risk culture and achieve success in your career as a risk management professional, you need a range of tools and concepts and ideas. So this is what I'm going to work on in this presentation is to give you a lot of these. Now, there's, before I do that, there's three things I'd like you to think about. Firstly, that without objectives, there are no success. So all of this has to link to objectives and how to achieve what we're trying to do. Because even in this day and age, especially today, um, having objectives is paramount to any measure of success in risk management. Secondly, I'd like to think about this concept in terms of the persistence and commitment to go through whether we work together on this or not, however you choose to do it. Um, I'll offer you some tools today, but it will take the usual persistence and um, just commitment to working it through. You'll have successes and failures along the way, uh, both personally and professionally, and, and that's all part of the journey. Now, last but not least, I'd like to highlight uh, the idea, think about what you want to get from this presentation. Now, have you, if you have that in mind, what your immediate issues with risk management are and your objectives from this presentation, then as we go through this, I'm going to have to go through it fairly quickly, but hopefully you already know what you're looking for and you'll know it when you see it. I've taken probably three days worth of material here to make this short presentation and it's by necessity it rattles along pretty quickly. So I think what you're going to find out is that we really have to, you can pause this and replay it later on at any date in the future, but for the moment, um, let me talk about briefly three types of risk, some risk analysis issues, causal chains, and then culture equals performance and how to change it. Some practical tips on that. So if I look from a little bit of context, this whole idea of this risk management journey we've been on for centuries, and it started with religion. It started with the idea that we were at the, the mercy of the gods. We worshipped the mountain or worship the deity, uh, maybe the volcano or the sun was our god. And as human beings, the best we could do was sacrifice the odd chicken. And then came along science with evidence-based theory, the scientific method, the repeatable research. And then we, we moved into this era of maths. So we looked, started looking at probability theory, looking at the law of large numbers. And now we, we have an era where um, there's a preeminence of the quants, as I like to call them. If you work in the financial markets, you'll understand what the quant is. And I say that with affection because I'm a bit of a numbers guy as when I love working with some of these models. So we have Monte Carlo, which was invented in the Manhattan Project. We have probability distributions. Concurrently with these sort of um, mathematical, evolutionary, scientific push towards more uh, detail and more numbers, we also have this sort of social sciences space where we've been looking at, um, you know, in a broader sense of, it's not only a soft sense, but the safety case, you know, making a case for safety, for looking at how we manage an enterprise, looking at culture and looking at the pointy end of culture and influencing it with behavioural science. Now, you know, I highlight that to, to bring us up to the point where we are constantly evolving and some of these ideas are evolving, but for what it's worth, I think you'll find them useful today. So first, I want to talk about three types of risk management. 
Now, <laughs> to be fair, I did make these three types up, but I think you'll see some uh, use in there. I think the first one I call procedural, and these are risks that we manage through procedural approaches, risks that we understand, which we can influence. So things like safety, insurance, engineering. We know we can build a gas plant or an oil rig based around mean time between failure of valves. We understand some of these concepts. This is driven by the law of large numbers. So the more data we have, the more information, the better we can manage it. The next one is what I call active risk, and that's things like financial risk management. It's you know competitive and adaptive, but mostly it's a benign risk. Um, project managers are classic, any business enterprise, marketing. And this is what I call run by law of the land. So the law of the land in the sense that it is within legal parameters. It's working with the laws of the jurisdiction you're in to try and achieve things without doing too much harm to anybody or without having to be you know, at the mercy of someone else. Now, as a third type of risk management, which I talk about, and I think of it as adaptive. And this is you know, the realm of security, law enforcement, military, geopolitical risk, where the it's adversarial, where the counterparty to this is actively trying to take us down. They are not only adversarial and trying to do us harm, but they're also adaptive to any risk management that we put in place. And the results are asymmetric. So a single hacker can have a major effect on a large corporation if we don't identify these risks. So this is the point where we're starting to make risk assessments, which are... Um, you know, we, we need to be thinking about not just how what we have just put in place or about to put in place manages our risk, but what's the bad guy or bad guys going to do in response to this? Now, first, let me give you some good news. We are living in, in an era of unprecedented peace, prosperity, and longevity. And largely, this I would like to say this was driven by good risk management, and to a certain extent it is. But ultimately, the biggest drivers of these have been two things. One is demographics. We've gone from a billion people to eight billion people almost basically in the space of a hundred years. So just in a few generations, we, we have this huge wealth growing. The baby boomers after World War II started uh, buying cars, buying houses, then you know buying TVs, buying cutlery, crockery, new clothes, updating the jewelry, all sorts of things. And that led to this time of amazing prosperity. Now what we've got is this um, the baby boomers are aging and they've been putting money into mostly the stock market through their superannuation funds or pension funds or 401ks, whichever country you live in. All the government has been promising a pension based around the idea that future taxpayers will pay for it. Now, this makes sense up to a point, except that this vast bubble of growth, the baby boomers are now retiring. So, but what's kept this also growing as a demographic trend of prosperity is a unlimited credit, large, you know, a boom in credit that we haven't seen in history before. So it's so much easier for anybody to borrow money for a house, companies to borrow money via bonds, governments to print money and borrow money, you know, almost from each other. And so we've seen this huge growth. We also have a whole range of issues with the millennials coming on board now and putting money into um, the stock market, largely through their superannuation funds, uh, through their pension funds. And so we've and unlimited credit is also driving this. So, but, but with all this has come peace, prosperity, and longevity. There is, however, some bad news with all this. You know, we are facing through the baby boomers retiring a major pension and demographic retirement crisis. We're also in the middle of uh, the worst pandemic we've seen in a hundred years. We're looking possibly at seeing the worst depression that we've seen in a hundred years, possibly even eclipsing the 1929 depression. Now, we're also looking at a whole range of financial systems which are in a state of flux. And I put all this to you in the context of these three types of risk, the law of large numbers, the law of the land, and the law of the jungle, and large asymmetric uh, adaptive risk, adversarial risk even. Because what happens is when you see this depression and economic problems, you also see civil unrest, you also see uh, warfare, you see a whole range of issues, and we're seeing that already. Now, you know, a good example of that is the IRA, which... For most of last century, certainly the latter half of last century, we're basically in a state of war in Northern Ireland. Now, I could say good military action, good policing action, good social action, a whole range of issues really helped to manage that. But if you really look at the drivers of what stopped the end of that war, or brought it to a conclusion, it was the economic boom in Ireland, and the Celtic tiger, as they called it, this economic boom, which meant that everybody had jobs, the people 
started to say, okay, well, actually, I don't want to go out and raise money for the cause, or I don't want to make bombs on the weekend. You know, I'd, I'd like to do an extra overtime shift so I can take my family on holiday, or I can buy upgrade our car, or, you know, buy a home, or buy a new TV. And so you see the reverse of that happening in countries where the economy is falling in disarray, where you start to see this whole process of um, civil unrest. So we're now coming into this system where, you know, the financial system for a range of reasons is, is in a state of flux, and we're on the brink perhaps of a whole new era with gold and Bitcoin. And I could talk about that endlessly, but the Congressional Budget Office in the US, for example, has projected that by 2050, the United States debt will be at 200% of GDP. Now, other analysis suggests it will actually at three times GDP to about $9 trillion. And there's some good evidence to support that. Maybe exactly what has to happen, at least some good modelling. Now, the World Bank and the IMF have basically put in place a couple of stages where at 77% of GDP, your stimulus starts to become ineffective. And you're not getting $1 of stimulus for $1 spent. You're getting like 70 cents of stimulus to the point where you have 120% of GDP. You're only getting you know, a dollar of stimulus maybe for every 10 that you spend. And the United States at the moment is at about 106%. And I'll refer to the US because we have good data there and basically their economy leads the world. So we have this whole process where you know there are 1.6 trillion dollars worth of student debt in the united states at the moment and and this is debt which cannot be forgiven even if you're bankrupt it still lingers there's 1.3 trillion worth of auto loan debt of which five percent or roughly 60 billion dollars is now in delinquent and i don't mean slightly delinquent i mean by more than 90 days so at least 90 days or more and the issue here is that people don't stop paying their car loan as the first loan, they stop paying. They need the car to get to work. They need the car to have a job, to earn money, to pay back their credit store loans, their housing and uh, mortgage, their rent. So these are the last loans that become delinquent, and these are the the, the canary in the uh, coal mine. We're also looking in a multilateral world where we had a um, you know bipolar, if you like, uh, world where essentially the United States and Russia were the two superpowers. We had a Cold War. Uh, we have a, a scenario now which is akin to the 1930s where there's a, a multilateral world evolving. So we're looking at a major depression, possibly, you know, and there's civil unrest and global conflict on the port bow. Now, that doesn't mean we're steering for it. It means it's on the port bow and we can avoid it. But if we don't take the right course, we could be in a you know very world of huge challenges. We've also got technology um, nanotechnology, biotechnology, genetic engineering, robotics, and artificial intelligence, which are evolving at an incredible pace. And any organization or country which gets to be six months ahead in artificial intelligence has a leap, an order of magnitude, which is just self-perpetuating. So I wanted to put all that together and highlight some of the types of risk analysis and why some of the current models of risk aren't working, because we're coming into a new world. So let's talk about risk analysis. Um, you know, we, we work with risk matrices and here's, here's a model which I, I use regularly as a strategic analysis tool and it's a conversational tool, discussion tool, not so much an analysis tool, but it helps with prioritizing risks and it helps with thinking about budgets and exposing ideas in terms of identifying risks. Now, you know, the y-axis is likely or the x-axis is consequence um, and there are really four categories of risk. So there's business as usual, which you know, I've used for your organization, like a chain of department stores might be petty theft. And routine might be fraud. So if you're a large bank or even a department store, you'll, you'll deal with very frequent but not ex excessively large, perhaps minor fraud. You will also look at this on the bottom right, I've got swans. And you're probably familiar with the black swan model. Now, I, you know, I like the idea of the black swan. I think Taleb's done some great work there. But I also think it's time to say the black swan is dead. Or more correctly, we know we've got white swans, we know we've got black swans, there could be red, green, blue, and it's lazy thinking to simply say, sorry boss, that was a black swan, we didn't see it coming. You know, there are a number of airlines, including Qantas, put up to the, um, the world, uh, the IATA Travel Authority in about the mid-90s about the idea of hijacked aircraft being weaponized and used as attack weapons. At the time, they were laughed out of the conferences and the meetings they went to. Uh, you know, so 9-11 was not a black swan, and it's, it is simply lazy thinking, I argue, to not be prepared for black swans and not think about all the things that could go wrong. Now, in the danger zone, are these risks of high likelihood, high consequence? 
And I would like to think that your organization and every organization are actually managing these risks really well because the organizations that don't, don't last long. But it's a really important thinking tool to think about which uh, risks we're looking at now. So let's talk about, there are a lot of people who have suggested there are some issues with risk matrices, Tony Cox among them, Douglas Hubbard, um, some great analysis. You know, I'll, I'll leave that slide there. You can have a look at it and think about it. Um, but, but essentially they can lead to worse than random decisions if they're not used correctly. Um, a group of people also, um, there's a Brat Build and uh, Dean and a couple of others have looked at risk matrices from a point of view of a meta study of how they're used in the hydrocarbon industry. I'll leave the links to all these so that you can follow these papers up. And I would encourage you to read uh, Tony Cox's paper on what's wrong with risk matrices and, and my counter on what's right with risk matrices, but also Doug Hubbard in his book, How to Measure Anything and How to Measure Anything in Cybersecurity, for example, gives some really good examples about the limitations of risk matrices. Now, I would argue, however, the limitations of risk matrices are not inherent to the risk matrix. It's how we use them. And the same limitations often apply to some of the alternative techniques. So let me give you one of the limitations of risk matrix. In this model, which is you know not atypical, unfortunately, there are, you know, we've highlighted the simple, the light green is very low, then the green is low, then medium risk is yellow, then high risk is orange, and very high is red, and just gone bloom across the risk matrix. But when you do the maths about, you know, 90% chance of a $10,000 risk being worth, you know, being medium and a $9,000 expected monetary value or cost of that risk, and this is just a numeric example, it's by no means a good risk matrix, nor is it one that anybody would probably use. But if you follow that all the way down to the bottom right, you see this 10% chance of a $100 million risk is also rated as a medium risk, and it gives us this 10 million. Now, there's no way in the world I can comfortably equate a $9,000 expected loss with a $10 million expected loss and call them both medium. So here's one simple limitation of the design of risk matrices where people get them wrong. Now, they, they do have a lot of useful tools because they're used frequently they're easy to understand and they're easy to express and easy to work, particularly at the front line where you're talking with tradespeople and, and supervisors, and you just want a tool which gets the idea of likelihood and consequence across and gives us some sort of a discussion framework for risk workshops. But one of the big problems here, and I've used the example for slips, trips, and falls. So someone slips on a wet concrete floor, we would say most probably they're just gonna have bruising and we would call that you know, a 2C. Consequence two, like you would see, that's it risk rated. In reality, what happens though, there's a range of outcomes. It's, you know, it's possible that someone will have no problem at all, get up and walk on smiling. It's probable they'll be bruised, maybe a first aid treatment. Possible they'll have a lost time injury, break their arm or something. You know, it's very unlikely that they'll die or have a medical treatment. But what we see here is a spread of outcomes. And this is one of the, you know, the better ways to think about risk matrices if you need to use them at all. And I'm not. Um, pro or anti-risk matrices. I think there are times when they are great and there are times when they are complete rubbish, but certainly don't throw the ba baby out with the bathwater. There are some better ways to use risk matrices and this example I've used a zero to one probability and I've looked at a zero to one in terms of consequence and said that one we have considered to be the net worth of this organization. You know, it could be a total revenue, your annual budget, three times your annual budget, but whatever you think to be the existential threat, the limit, if you lost three times your annual budget or one times your net worth, would that make your organization fail? So in this scenario, we said yes, you know, 100% of net worth is a catastrophic loss. In a lot of models though, we don't think about how likely it is. And I've used risk B here, for example, to say that it's 30% likely that this risk will actually occur. So that's, that's a first input. Then if it does happen, there's a range of consequences. And we say, well, it's, it's almost, you know, it's almost certain that it won't cost at its worst anything more than 75% of our net worth. It's most likely to cost us somewhere between 40% and 70% of net worth. And you could do this model with lives, with a whole range of reputations, and any number of things that you could do with. But this, I think, is a better way to use a risk matrix. A probability distribution, we're all familiar with the concept of a bell curve and IQs. You know, we use them sometimes in risk plotting to say, okay, you know, point A, uh, this is the amount of risk we can afford to lose, so maybe we should insure, and if that's a $4 million to $12 million along the bottom, we could afford $4 million in cost, and then after that we're, we're bankrupt. So we might want to put in place an insurance policy with a $4 million excess, so you know it would cover everything above that. And, and the curve on the right there is really about saying at what point, you know, so at 
when we talk about $12 million, we know we've covered 100% of the risk, at least in this model. You know, if we're talking about um, somewhere, let's say it's, oh, this is uh, $6 million, we know that's 40% likelihood that all the, the consequences are under that level. Now, when you extrapolate a lot of this, uh, you get this wonderful tool called Monte Carlo Modeling. And I, and I quite like Monte Carlo Modeling. It's a, you know, it's a sledgehammer. I wouldn't use it to do a risk assessment for your um, staff picnic, but it's a great tool where you've got good data. And it came from the Manhattan Project when they were trying to work out some of the probabilities and likely outcomes. Um, you can understand if we roll two dice, this is the probability distribution for the dice. We're almost certainly going to roll, you know, or more frequently going to roll seven um, out of 36 sort of thing. So this is the most likely, you know, four and a three, five and a two, six and a one. But we could roll any of these. Now, the idea of Monte Carlo is that you, you don't know for certain if a given number of people for, and this example is around, you know, how much pesticide or DDT, let's say, is in apples. How many apples a person eat, eats each year in terms of kilograms of apples and what their body mass is. So, you know, 20 kilo child versus a 200 kilo adult. And if you think about a, an individual, you know, we can relatively easily work out their exposure. But if we're looking at a population, we need to think about, well, how many people? Most people are sort of between 40 kilos and 90 kilos, but some are 150 or 200 most people eat maybe a kilo to two to maybe 10 kilos of apples a year. So we have a different type of curve for these and we can model how that looks in terms of distribution. And this is all a great modeling tool for risk. The problem is you do need to know the probability distributions for each of those. So if you look at foreign exchange or in the previous example, um, where someone lives might affect the concentration of DDT in the apples that they have access to. Also, um, you might look at a range of people's body mass, a range of how many apples they consume each year, so this sort of thing. But there are lots of limitations with Monte Carlo. You know, first of all, you know, you can see in this example, this is a model of, you know, a compendium of four risk. It's just a sample that I grabbed from a website. Um, it, so you, you look at, you know, in this scenario, it, there's not much likelihood there projected of this risk not manifesting. You know, we may be looking at a risk or a bundle of risk, which actually are very, very unlikely. But that depends on the time frame, of course. So if we're talking on, a, you know, as, as this great quote, favorite quote from Fight Club, uh, on a long enough time frame, everybody's life expectancy falls to zero. So if you're looking at um, looking at terrorism risk for the Olympics, you know, over a four-year period of building the complex, it's quite low. Over a two-week period, it, it it builds up. It's a higher risk. Um, and if you look at the four hours of the opening and closing ceremonies, you again got a different risk profile. So time frame is really key. Monte Carlo is also expensive. It, it's time, you need a lot of data, you need some analysis, you need people with really core skills, and it also needs distribution data. So it doesn't work with a lot of these adaptive adversarial risks, which you're constantly adapting. So rare events like meteorite strikes, um, uh, terrorism attacks, um, hacking attacks, cyber attacks, all these things are very difficult to calculate and know the probability of distribution because you are dealing with an adaptive adversarial um, asymmetric risk. And indeed, with financial markets, Monte Carlo doesn't cope very well with things like global financial crises or the vagaries of stock market based on human emotion. And also a big limitation of a lot of these methods, and I'd say risk matrices as well, and one of the reasons that the challenges with that study that was done with the petrochemical risk matrices and risks was there was no analysis done on the quality of the risk statements. So, you know, the people that you're looking at, Tony Cox, Doug Hubbard, um, Dylan Evans, and the paper on um, Petro, the limit, or the risk of using risk matrices, it's called, uh, by Bratvold, Thomas, and Bicker. Um, really interesting, some little bit academic. Um, Doug Hubbard's stuff is probably more accessible. But again, you read all this stuff with a pinch of salt because you need to think about the limitations of it. And one of the big limitations is, you know, that previous model I showed you, that graph, one of the risks there that was in that model was just called data breach. Now, data breach is not a risk. Data breach, you know, it's a different risk if you're thinking about the consequence of the risk, the asset at risk, the source, the event. They're all quite different. I'm going to rattle through these quickly, but you can express a different risk, you know, if it's the source is a state actor or it's a criminal group or it's a lone wolf or it's a trusted insider. You know, do we breach the financial system? What's the asset at risk? So how do we express this when we look at you know, the event, the asset, the source, and the consequence. And when you do these, you've got a much better picture and you've got a different risk. It's ultimately a different risk from an insider versus a state actor. So 
you cannot do an apples for apples and just say it's a data breach. It just doesn't work. So one of the models I use if you want to look at doing good risk analysis is to think about, build a table of all the sources of risk, all the events that you're concerned about within your scope, the assets that could be attacked, the consequence that might happen, and the objectives that could be impacted. And in this little model, I've basically given you four risks created just by looking at three sources, you know, one event, a network breach, and I've looked at included vulnerability in here. Network breach we're concerned about was due to the software, security software patches not being updated, maybe using old uh, operating systems on the server, whatever. And then you follow risk number one through with this kind of idea, and you can make a simple risk statement. So in this case, basically, I've said loss of profits due to foreign intelligence service you know, acting breaching our network and providing um, some of the, our core cost of sales and manufacturing data to some of their large uh, enterprises. So if you think about a country which wants to buy you know, what they know, they have a large uh, public transport network, a state public transport buyer of buses, for example, if they can get in and find out all the core cost data and what the bare minimum walk away price is for the sale being just barely profitable, you know, this could cost tens of millions of dollars. So this is a very different risk from a uh, criminal group trying to extort through a ransomware attack or trying to sell the data or use credit cards. Now we know Swiss cheese, it's, you know, it's a great model. It, you know, if all the holes line up, things go wrong. Piper Alpha is a great example. I've put a link here where you can get in at the end of this presentation where you can find you know, one of the best engineering causal link processes I've found. Now Piper Alpha was a rig in the North Sea, which in on the 6th of July at 10 p.m. in 1988, uh, suffered a catastrophic failure. This this was Piper Alpha roughly at 9 p.m. that night. This was Piper Alpha 12 hours later. You know, it was just a complete, sadly, 166 men lost their lives in this. And it, uh, you know, this at the peak of it around about midnight that night in the North Sea where it was quite light that evening, that was what was going on at Piper Alpha. Now you can find um, the details of the presentation there, but basically when you look at this model, you know, firstly, a uh, a condensate pump tripped out at nine o'clock and the night shift crew decided they would switch back to an alternate pump. This pump had just been taken offline for maintenance but only a couple of hours earlier and they thought, well, nothing had been done, we'll switch it back on. But one of the pressure relief valves had been removed and for a whole range of reasons, they were unaware of this. You know, the permit to work system wasn't working. There was a new supervisor in place, the root cause. Now I can model this and I've done quite extensively modeled it. And when you look at it on the top there, there's sort of the consequences in red. You look at the event and I put some um, commentary there about it. And then the act, human acts, decisions that were made, the preconditions for those supervisory consequences or the supervisory oversight limitations and the organizational influences. So when they switched on this other um, first pump that had just been taken offline, uh, it breached the pressure valve, killing two people in a gas explosion there. That gas explosion also blew out the fireproof walls. Now the fireproof walls had been identified as part of the, you know, someone had said, well, that we could have a fire there, so we need to put in some fireproof walls. But inadequate design analysis and hazard analysis had failed to identify that could also be where there was fire, there could be explosion. So the explosion took out the blast walls, it took out the communications, it took out the power system, um, which meant that at the same time, you know, the fire suppression system failed because the power system wasn't working. They'd recognized this and they'd put in place an alternative, a backup system, which worked on diesel pumps. Unfortunately, the diesel pumps, instead of being switched to auto, were switched on a manual that day. As it turned out, it was normal practice because in summertime, they have divers in the water for about 12 hours a day. And there was a risk that the divers could be sucked into the intakes if these pumps started automatically. However, they were left on manual all the time, even when the divers were not working near the intakes. And at that night, there were no divers in the water, but the pumps had been left on manual, so they failed to start. Even if they had managed to start, it's unlikely they would have worked because the corrosion from the salt water, the system, the nozzles and pipes and uh, systems for the fire suppression system, the deluge system, couldn't cope with salt water. They corroded and blocked. And, and sadly, this had been identified and partly remediated in a, in a section that actually wasn't involved in this fire, had already been remediated, but this has been identified four years earlier. So, you know, there's complete failure of organizational oversight, the senior leadership to manage it. Now, the fire kept burning, this oil fire kept burning because two more rigs were connected to Piper Alpha and Piper Alpha then pumped to the mainland. But 
these two rigs just kept pumping oil. And the reason when asked afterwards, why did you keep pumping oil in there? Well, we thought they had it under control. We didn't hear any bad news from the comms, which of course had been taken out by the fire, so they couldn't hear any bad news. But ultimately they hadn't even been trained in emergency response, so they had no process. The operators of those rigs hadn't been trained in how to manage a multi-rig emergency. So the fire suppression system failed. Uh, in the middle of this oil pipe fire was also a, a main gas riser which came from you know subsurface gas going into the production facility on Piper Alpha and this was in the middle of this fire. With the fire suppression system failed it was only a matter of time before this overheated resulting in a catastrophic explosion. Now um, by this time you know it, it, it almost didn't matter for the, the remainder of people who were on this rig because you know a hundred of them had gone to the accommodation module as per their emergency instructions where they would be evacuated by helicopter but with this huge oil fire the smoke clouds obscured the um, helicopter deck it also obscured the way to lifeboats you know just a tragedy unfolding they'd also had this supervisory oversight because the you know the system the air conditioning systems cut down and they would have kept the smoke out but the normal practice on this rig was to open the fire doors because the people would come and go and ease of access so the fire doors letting smoke in um, you know, luckily 28 people did survive, but only by jumping into the sea that night. So this catastrophic gas explosion, you know, I'll leave that model there for you. There's so much in this, and I've sent a link to a better analysis. But what I'm getting at here, any investigation that I've conducted or seen or, you know, been involved in, it's never been a single element, and especially where there's been a fatality. It takes multiple, often a dozen things have to go wrong before you see this catastrophic failure. So we look at this, you know, the idea of bow tie. I think most of you are familiar with bow tie. It's a great model of, you know, multiple sources could cause a, a single event. You know, a fire could be caused by any electrical failure, an arson attack, of, you know, just a, some sort of uh, a system failure. And it could lead to multiple consequences. And there are multiple barriers in that way. Now, taking that to the next level up, we want to have a look at this idea of looking at the top event. So now this I modeled just a really easy to, you know, I've worked with a security example here. The sarin gas in Tokyo, this was, I've taken some liberty with this, but, but essentially this, uh, I've taken some more detail and looked at it and said, for example, the, the top event, you know, the nerve gas was released in the tunnel, the immediate cause, and there were several here, but the top one just says nerve agent was placed in the tunnel where the train had stopped at the signals. And the reason they knew where to place it and where the train would stop was because the plans for the tunnel and all the signal systems were in town hall easily accessible. So the remedial action there is to identify, classify, and move away any sensitive information. And you can see I've done that in parallel with each of these with information security people, physical security management. Um, so you can see there's a range of different domains there. Now looking, taking that to the next level again, if you look at human factors, and this HVACs was developed by the United States Department of Defense uh, to work with naval aircraft on aircraft carriers. And they were finding that of their accidents, you know, 90% of their accidents were caused by human errors. So they created this four-tiered system. And if you put this same sort of analysis into the model I just showed you, and again, here's a little bit of a close-up, just looking at a sample of it. So the same sort of um, gas attack post-event issues as well. So here I'm saying two people died because the ambulances couldn't get through. Uh, they couldn't get through because the, um, essentially the triage, unable, people doing the triage unable to communicate with the ambulances. There was a precondition where they had inadequate redundancy, redundancy and emergency response communications. And they had, a, you know, the divisional managers weren't trained in thinking about how to manage this emergency plan, emergency plan development. And then you look at this inadequate risk assessment of emergency response. So I've put in place some remedial actions. Again, these are a bit fictional just to illustrate the point. Uh, but, you know, I've used similar things with some um, obviously, you know, sensitive client data, which I can't put up here. But the same sort of model is a great way to do a one page analysis. Now, when you look at these models and think about them, don't just do this on uh, something that's happened. Do it by all means, do it on an incident to get to the heart of it, but do it on a near miss so you avoid having the incident and do it as part of the risk analysis causal chain program. Because if this is what I'm saying, you know, there are limitations to risk matrices, there are limitations to quantitative analysis, there are limitations to all sorts of things. You know, I love the bow tie table, that's another presentation. But looking at this type of analysis and breaking the causal chain. So Swiss cheese is the concept, but a far more important one is this causal chain idea. You can do the same thing with another model I've used here, which is um, Circle. 
which is basically sources, events, resources, consequences, and likelihood, thinking about how they fit with existing controls, how risk ratings come into the equation and treatment plans. You know, I've got a number of models like this which you can use and you can invent your own. The biggest thing out of all this though, when you think about causal chains and you think about what went wrong with Piper Alpha, and it's, I, I love Piper Alpha because you know it's, it's tragic and I, and I don't like it for that, but I do like that it's one of the best, uh, most thoroughly examined industrial accidents uh, of all time. And it's so many lessons to take away from it. If you just look at Brian Appleton's presentation, you'll see. But one of the things is culture. I'm going to talk very quickly about culture. Um, the Dunning-Kruger effect, there was a, a classic there with a permit to walk permit to work system on the Piper Alpha. Any number of audits, of, every day the permit to work system was audited. It was also externally audited. Nobody identified any failures with it and they all thought, right, it's a great system and it's working well. And you know, it wasn't working well. The, the valve, the permit that identified that the pressure relief valve had been removed was not cross-linked to the permit with the pump that was turned on. If they'd been cross-linked, then the operators of night shift would not have turned that on because they would have seen there was a lockout on that particular section. Equally, the permit to work wasn't examined. It was just thrown on the desk. Um, it wasn't uh, signed off by the process supervisor because he was busy that day, so a contractor supervisor signed it. The valve had been removed and the permit done by a supervisor who was his first time ever as a supervisor. So they actually didn't know. You know all the training, in fact, was done not formally in permit to work. It was done with on-the-job training, which means any errors were embedded in the system and the whole framework of it. So, you know, this Dunning-Kruger effect basically says that um, <laughs> with your level of, you know, the lower your level of competence or knowledge, on average, the more likely you are to feel confident about it. And so this is a little bit, learning to drive is a good example. And you think, you know, as a kid, you think it's easy to drive. I see mum and dad do it all the time. I see the bus driver do it. Can't be hard. I know everything, you know, you're 17, you go, I'm, I'm cocky, I know how to drive. You start driving and you figure out this balance between clutch, brake, gears, indicators, traffic, and suddenly you go, hey, there's more to this than I thought. And after a while, you're like, oh, I'm never going to get the hang of this. It's <laughs> This is way too complicated. Gradually, it's starting to make sense. Then you get to the trust me, it's complicated. And, you know, when you look at things like climate change or you talk to scientists about this, you know, the real experts in the field are not cocky about their knowledge. They know how little they truly know and how much more there is to learn. You know, and I'm one of these guys who reads the, uh, you know, you look at fake news and and the news that goes out on Facebook and the way a lot of people do get their information and the media sensationalizing stuff. I will see things in the media saying, you know, a new report says that the climate, you know, world oceans are going to be high, six meters higher in 2100. I'm one of those guys who goes back and look at the original research and often it says something like, uh, you know, we, we model this with a 90% confidence interval and at the highest, the sea levels could go to six meters. We think they're probably the lowest, you know, we're going to see a, a 0.8 of a meter and most likely a median of about 2.5 meters. But the press don't report 2.5 meters because it's not that exciting. So they report six meters and then people will tell you with great confidence that the sea is going to rise six meters, just for example. I'm taking a random example here, but they will tell you that this is a major risk or this is the truth or this is an absolute truth. And often it's not. So, you know, what do we do with this? And we do, um, training is one of the ways to overcome this. And look, the reality of Dunning-Kruger effect, quite often, unfortunately, is that the less competent someone is, the more confident they are. But this is partly to do with culture. And I think many people will say culture change can be done in the space, you know, by changing the leader. It can be done with the space of a weekend workshop with all the, the team there. But the only truly effective way I've seen to change culture is with training, because training changes behavior. Behavior changes attitude, attitude changes culture. When enough people's attitude changes, culture changes. Now, training changes culture in, in all behaviors in two ways. First, it gives people more tools. So when they come to the same problem, they will choose the optimal tool in their range of the toolbox and more tools, they're more likely to have a better tool and they'll use it. Equally, when you send someone training, you send a very important message that this is important because people don't judge what you say is important by by what they don't judge what's important by what you say is important. They don't judge what's important by what you do. They judge what's important by where you spend your time. So if you spend your time in meetings with people and working with people face to face as versus sending emails, you know, if you spend all your time behind the computer sending emails, people judge that that's more important than they are. And if you equally send someone away for a three day training program, 
they realize time is important. And when you put aside three days of their time, you send them this, take them out of the office, put them three days of training, they work out that this is an important thing subconsciously. And then when they behave differently with the tools they've got, using better tools for the right job, cognitive dissonance basically says we can't hold two conflicting thoughts. You know, if we're doing something, and it must be because it's the right idea. So when we behave a certain way, cognitive dissonance kicks in at a very subconscious level that we start to see that this behavior is important and correct. And that changes our attitude and collectively attitude changes culture. It's a little like working, if you think about uh, construction work these days, you'll never see anybody, you know, at least in, in Australia, on a construction site without a high-vis vest and helmet. Um, when I was working construction as a 17-year-old in 1980, it was optional and helmets didn't exist safety boots for optional high vis was you know not even invented if you put a high vis vest on you know people would have said oh you're a sissy what are you doing that for now you go into a construction site and some big burly bloke go you cannot come on here without a high vis vest and a helmet that's cultural change now culture drives performance but it's not as simple as that you need to start with the objectives the objectives of the organization and the objectives you want to achieve from this training and culture change then you need to do a thorough training needs analysis, which is essentially a gap analysis between what you've got and where you want to be. Then you deliver training, which changes behavior, drives attitude, drives culture. Culture then drives performance, and performance delivers the outcomes. Now, very quickly, I'm running out of time here. Uh, a couple of last points. Firstly, the Kirkpatrick training levels is, you know, level one is very important. Level one is just reaction, so it's a smiley face. At the end of a day of training, did you enjoy it? Was the coffee good? Was the presenter entertaining? Good. Level two is, a, was there a transfer of knowledge? So if you, an example of that is at the day one, the morning of a three-day course, you give someone 20 multiple choice questions and they get 12 right out of 20. At the end of day three of this training program that you've you know customized to develop the objectives, they now get 16. So they went from 12 on day one to 16 out of 20 on day three there's been a transfer of knowledge. They now know more than they did on day one. Uh, level three is, was there a change in behavior? So six months perhaps, or whatever time interval is suitable, you go into the workforce and you see, are people doing things differently? Are they using the permit to work? Are they clearing things properly? Do they have job hazard analysis in place? Have they uh, run a project team properly? And then level four might be, you know, again, a, to pick a number, 18 months in the future after the training, are the outcomes in the teams and the workplace and the organization being delivered. So did you see outcomes and results for the training? So that's a very quick view of how to do that. But I just want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. Firstly, that risk management is ultimately about future management. It's, um, it's not an abstract idea. We are creating the future through risk management. It's the tool for that. And I just want to come back to the idea that we are living in this unprecedented peace, prosperity, and longevity but it is by no means certain. And we are coming into a time of incredible uncertainty. Technology is advancing at a galloping rate. Um, the financial system is you know, potentially in, in disarray. It's going along, but we are facing the, a lot of new changes. We're facing potential for civil unrest and, and global depression. So risk management is ever more important. And especially when you think about these asymmetric risks of global financial crises, when you think about adversarial risks about transnational terrorism and you think about the you know criminal cyber hacking data breaches all the things that are facing and you know i think cyber is the, the big thing for the future we need to be looking at how that impacts every aspect of our operations but when you look at all these it's up to us as risk managers to share the word to use the right tools and continue that peace and prosperity so thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you very much, Riskin, uh, for such a great conference and inviting me along. You can contact me at juliantalbot.com. I've also put the link there at juliantalbot.fyi.to slash risk hyphen analysis, and that will take you to some links for some more research and articles, and as well as a, a series of downloads and templates and more articles. And, and um, So hopefully all that, that's been useful. Uh, look, I'd love to hear your questions and I'll hand that over now for Q&A. Thanks very much.